G'day, every F1 driver has a contract. They or their manager would have spent hours negotiating it with their team. Lawyers on both sides would have then poured over the paperwork before the two parties signed off on it and then proudly announced it to the world. But what do those contracts contain? You're about to find out. Starting salary for an F1 driver is around 500,000 US dollars, but it could rise to well over 60 million dollars a year if you are a world champion. Now that figure is typically made up of a base salary plus bonuses. For that money, a driver will obviously have to drive the car. And the more they are paid, the higher the expectations. So what will the teams expect of a driver? Well, the performance clauses will dictate that. Let's take a look at Sergio Perez. It's been mentioned that he has a clause in his contract that if he falls 150 points behind his teammate Max Verstappen, he would be penalised and probably in the form of a pay cut. Of course, these are put in place to keep a driver motivated and focused. After all, big dollars are at stake and a team can't afford to have drivers slacking off. But what about crashes? Would a driver be expected to pay for any damage that he causes? Well, in the lower classes of racing, a driver not only has to pay for their drive, but they also have to pay for damage. That is much rarer in Formula One, if it happens at all. Now, with Black Friday coming up, let me tell you that Quadlock is having a Black Friday sale. At the moment, everything is 30% off. Just go to the link in my description. Oh, and if you're new here and don't know what Quadlock does, they make innovative smartphone mounting systems for every adventure whether it's on four wheels, two wheels, or navigating through the waters. There's no doubt that Quadlock has made my life a lot easier. I do a heck of amount of traveling, and if it weren't for their mag wallet, I would have lost my credit cards and ID countless times. I love their selfie stick, I've used it in a couple of my videos in the past, and note too that it does double as a tripod. Very handy for my travel vlogs. Another great option, car mounts. As someone who is prone to touching my phone while driving, Quadlock's car mounts are a game changer. And to get your Quadlock products from pretty much anywhere in the world, click on the link in the description below and save 30% right now. Other things included in a driver's contract are appearances. Now there will be typically a number mentioned. And for a younger driver, that could be around 60. For someone like a Lewis Hamilton though, that might be 20 to 40. It's all open to negotiation. Could a team place restrictions on a driver's appearance? Yes. It might be that beards aren't allowed, no tattoos, or certain hairstyles. Why? Because it might go against the look or the branding of the team. Certainly worked into contracts would be media appearances, and typically that will um, be at the track on a Thursday, but there could be other calls on a driver to make themselves available outside of track days for TV or media appearances. That's something a lot of drivers just don't like. And I understand why, because often it's the same questions over and over. But if you're on the big money, it's part of the game. On the other side, a driver's contract could contain clauses that allow the driver to place demands on the team. For instance, if the team can't provide a competitive car, there might be a financial penalty on the team, or the driver might be able to break their contract and leave early. Back to the payment side of things, what bonuses might be on offer? Well, it could be X amount of euros per point scored. Lando Norris might get an extra million euros if he wins the championship. Fernando Alonso might be in for a big payday if he makes the top 10. It depends on where the team expects to sit. And if that driver outperforms that expectation, he would expect a bonus and is often paid one. What about some of the quirkier things that are included in contracts? Could a driver, for instance, end up owning their race car? Yes, I know of at least one driver who has a race car that he drove to a win as part of his package. How does that happen? Well, a manager obviously sees that as an important point and works that into the negotiations. Still on the subject of race cars, going back to 1990, Nigel Mansell signed on to go back to Williams for two years. He negotiated an exclusive use of the spare car back in the days when they did have a spare. So him having access to two cars in a session, just in case one broke down, meant that he was really going to lose time on track. Of course, that was to the detriment of his teammate. But when you're negotiating a contract, you're typically not worried about your teammate. Could it say a Ferrari driver work into their contract that they wanted a Ferrari as part of their package? Without a shadow of a doubt. Charles owns this Ferrari along with a Pura Sangue. And I would be very surprised if that wasn't worked into his contract 
that that was part of the consideration for driving for the team. Sponsorships too is a very important part of a contract. Teams want their drivers to sell their sponsors products, so they might go into some detail in a contract about what a driver is expected to do. A driver on the other hand will probably want to get their own sponsors because that money goes directly to them. Are there any limitations? Well, a contract can state the number of personal sponsors a driver can accept. And I know one team that says two is the maximum. So a driver better make sure they're big value sponsors if they can only have a couple. A team will also ban sponsor clashes. I remember that uh, Charles Leclerc some years ago decided he might do his own fashion label, but the team said no because we have a fashion sponsor. And I imagine that would have been worked into his contract that there can be no conflict of personal and team sponsors. A few years ago, Marcus Ericsson and I were chatting and I noticed he was wearing Modo Spectacles, which is not a sponsor of his team. The sponsor was Ray-Ban, but they didn't make spectacles. There was a contract issue about this because he was required to wear the team glasses. So what was the solution? Well, he was allowed to wear his glasses in the paddock, but he had to have his Ray-Bans hung around his neck to appease the sponsor. A powerful driver, someone at the top level, might also negotiate that they won't do anything with a sponsor that perhaps conflicts with their personal beliefs, perhaps alcohol, perhaps tobacco. Whether the team agrees to that, that all gets back down to how much they want the driver. Are they willing to compromise that in order to get him? Most teams have a watch sponsor, and that would involve the drivers wearing the watch at certain times, um, after the race, in the TV media pen, etc. But away from the track, a team would be hard pressed to include any restrictions on drivers wearing the team watches. So a driver could take a personal sponsor and only wear a watch away from the track. Another discussion point in the negotiation of a contract would be how many passes a driver is able to access. Why? Well, he'll want to from time to time uh, bring his girlfriend, almost certainly his manager, perhaps family and some friends. And of course, there are a limit to the number of passes a team gets for the paddock. So a lower ranked driver will probably end up with fewer passes than say a Lewis or a Charles or a Lando Norris. Another area of negotiation that Lewis Hamilton seems to have mastered is what they can wear to the track. Lewis, as you know, wears fashionable gear every single day. Other drivers like Joe, Daniel, Lando, Charles, Pierre, Yuki and Valtteri have been known to wear in non-team kit which I imagine is in all of their contracts that you have to wear our team gear while you're at the track or at a sponsor event. Recently, I was talking to a driver about a signed print deal and the team advised that no, that driver can't do a signed print collaboration with you, Kim, because that is a bonus reserved for our sponsors. In other words, the driver's signature commercially belongs to the team, not him but that's probably a rarity. What about advertising space on a driver's helmet or race suit? Well, a driver owns their own helmet. They can do as they wish with it. So the team would negotiate with them about what logos go on their helmet, but they would have to negotiate with the team about the race suit because effectively the team owns the race suit. And the other thing to note is that a driver can sell their helmets as a form of income because they own them whereas in most cases a driver's race suit belongs to the team. Of course, all of this negotiation gets down to having a good manager. And if you have a look at someone like uh, Oscar Piastri, managed by Mark Webber, Oscar gets all of the benefit of Mark's years driving in the sport. It's been suggested that Mark Webber worked into Oscar's contract the fact that he's not to be referred to or treated as a second driver. Mark knew what it was like to be a second driver when he partnered Sebastian Vettel at Red Bull and perhaps... With that knowledge, he doesn't want Oscar to go down that route. And addressing it in a contract is a smart move. And do all drivers have a manager? Um, yeah, I believe so. It's a wise move. Yes, you give up perhaps 10 to 20% of your income, but you've got someone there looking out for you all the time. And if you're a young driver coming into this sport, you're not going to know anywhere near as much as someone like a Mark Webber or a Flavio Briatore, who's been around for quite some time. Other clauses in an F1 driver's contract, perhaps a right of first refusal. A team might say, look, if you get an offer from another team, we want to be able to match that team. And if we can't, then you can leave. Disrepute. Yes, if a driver happens to go on a bender and cause the team some damage, embarrassment, cost them a sponsor, that could have a detrimental effect on their contract. And often the penalty for such conduct is contained in a contract. A driver could also be restricted from dangerous activities like um, snow skiing, 
uh, water skiing, motorcycling, things that could cause injury to him and then uh, leave the team at a disadvantage. One Pablo Montoya claimed to have an injury that he got playing tennis some years ago, but many believe it was actually the result of a motocross bike tumble. His team boss, though, Ron Dennis, said, look, I'm not bothered about what the drivers do in their own time. We have one rule. If you don't drive, you don't get paid. And is that still the case now? Did Kevin Magnuson get paid when he lost demerit points on his licence and was forced to sit out a race this year, which Ollie Behrman filled in for him for? I don't know. It depends what the contract said. And are there any crazy riders put into contracts? Riders being something like a pop star might want, look, I want a sauna in the backstage area and I want 10,000 M&Ms. I don't think there's too many things like that. But once again, I'm not privy and neither are you to what these contracts contain. And certainly no driver is going to tell you what's in there, neither will a team, but plenty of others in the sport will gladly speculate. Other team principals uh, have often told me what they think might be in a contract. Other drivers have perhaps mentioned something they think might be in someone else's contract. So talking to a number of different people, you do get a feel for what could be happening behind the scenes. Let's go to media. Uh, Drivers, typically would sell their image rights to a team and that would be part of the contract. So when Ray-Ban comes to say a Ferrari and says look we want the two drivers to be involved in a campaign, typically that instance would have been clarified in the contract. If it's not there would be some negotiating at that point. Social media, uh, a driver might be somewhat restrained on what they can put on their social media. Even though it's their account the team might say we want some say in it and that would typically be detailed in a contract. Now let's look at what happens if a driver wants to get out of their contract. Perhaps Carlos Sainz has in his contract with Williams that if one of the top two or three teams say they want me, I've got the right to break the contract and go to them. That's something that would have been negotiated at the time of signing. And what's the thinking behind someone like a Lewis Hamilton announcing his move to Ferrari so early on in 2024? Well, in that instance, maybe the team figured that uh, this was about to leak and they wanted to get a jump on it. But going early with an announcement of a driver will often mean that the teams can then go out and find sponsors well ahead of time that fit with that driver and the team. And what is the duration of an F1 contract? Well, it can vary. Uh, At the moment, you've got Franco Colapinto in there for a duration of nine races. Then you've got other drivers who have signed long-term agreements. What was it? Five or six years. But that is definitely unusual. And if one party is unhappy about an arrangement, it's very hard to make that relationship work. At some point, things often turn unworkable, in which case both parties are keen to just get out of it. Go back to Daniel Ricciardo and McLaren. McLaren just faced a big payout for Daniel to leave the team. Contract negotiations can take a heck of a long time. And when drivers or teams think they're very close to getting a signature, often one party brings up something that hasn't been considered. And that can result in a lengthy delay or perhaps even the falling over of an agreement. As they say, it's all wank till it's in the bank. And until both parties have signed that piece of paper, there is no agreement. Hopefully you've learnt a little bit more about what's in a driver's contract. And if you have enjoyed this video, please hit the like button and subscribe if you haven't already done so. Thanks for watching and stay passionate. Let's have a look, see if that's okay. It needs to be up a little bit higher.